God's love. Elevating, energizing, empowering. Miracles happen when you know that you are loved. Peter Youngren has communicated God's love with millions from every religion and culture. Get ready for your ultimate life because you are loved. It was not the greatest in money, but I remember it so well. It was a lot for a 15-year-old boy. That's all I can say. Maybe that was bigger than anything that I've given, and I was given, you know, so small compared to amounts that Tina and I have, are giving today, but, but who is to say? I said, you know, in World Impact Ministries, the largest gift I ever received was when a person invited me to Beverly Hills. You know, good things happen in Beverly Hills. Uh, but but I said, that's the biggest as far as numbers go. But I said, I don't know if that's the biggest gift because to me, maybe the very biggest gift I received was when I was a preacher starting out in Kariaku, Caribbean. And this little lady, she was probably 80 years old, who had nothing. I stayed in a little hut by the ocean, no electricity, only some mice and a rat and myself in the whole place. But this lady would come every day. She had a bandana, she'd take off her bandana and she would just fill it with peanuts and she'd come and put it on the porch. First time, I, she didn't stop, she didn't knock, she just put it there. I said, somebody was on the porch, I had to go and look and she was already gone. Next day she comes again and I thought, she, she was a lady who had nothing. She could have sold those peanuts in the market. Maybe, maybe that's the greatest offering that I've ever seen. I don't know. Only God knows. But I say, so it's not equal giving. It's equal faith and equal sacrifice. Here's a scripture verse that so much blesses me. It says in Isaiah 32, 8, a generous person devises generous things and by generosity he shall stand. A generous person, that's a person who by nature is generous. Well, uh, the one who is generous by nature is God. God so loved that he gave. Uh, but such a person, I'm talking about you and I now, because we are made in the image of God and we are partakers of God's nature. A generous person is scheming, planning, thinking, how can I do generous things? And then somehow that characteristic of generosity, it helps us to stand in the storms of life when trouble comes. And uh, I was talking about you know, many people approach the area of generosity and giving from an old covenant perspective. And the old covenant perspective, according to the apostle Paul, is that whatever the people did, they did grudgingly and out of necessity. It was hard work. They were struggling. They were trying to please God. They were hoping that God would open the windows of heaven. But see, in the new covenant, whatever we do, we give a smile. We share love with someone. We, we reach out to help someone. We don't do it grudgingly or on necessity, but we do it cheerfully. I talked about that scripture verse that says that God loves a cheerful giver. You know, I used to try to ratchet down that verse. I thought, well, you know, God loves a cheerful giver. So I used to kind of rephrase it, well, God takes pleasure in or God delights in a cheerful giver. But then I had to look up what it really says in the Greek. It says, God agape, God agapes. I mean, that's the unconditional love of God. So I, I, I had to look at that scripture again and I had to say, whenever we do something cheerfully, we do something joyously. That is compatible with agape. But doing something grudgingly, doing something, okay, I'll do it if I have to, that is not compatible with agape. Uh, you see, the whole old covenant way of doing things under Moses, it was very hard. Some of you have been with me to Israel, you know that when it's Sabbath in Jerusalem, we never stay. We never keep our tour group in Jerusalem during the Sabbath. Why? Because it's, it's so painful to be there. We go to the Dead Sea and splatter around in the salt water uh, because in, in Jerusalem, it's just hard to be there. Religion made it hard. You can't even, you know, the elevator stops on every floor. How many know that's inconvenient? You see, according to the law of the Orthodox Jewish people, you can only travel so far on the Sabbath. So I experienced this one time in Israel that, that, you know, we had like a hotel 30 stories high. And so somebody, we all waiting on the bus and then somebody forgot their passport or their wallet and they have to go back to the 30th floor and the elevator stops on every floor and every floor and then coming down, stopping on every floor. And, and you're not really happy about the Sabbath anymore. You say you're holding up the whole bus because of this Sabbath. Well, that's how the whole covenant of, of Moses was. It, it was hard. You had to struggle. You had to try 
try to, it's, you, you did things grudgingly. But then, then comes the new covenant and we do things cheerfully, joyously. We say, thank God for his goodness. Uh, blessed be the name of the Lord who has blessed me. So, so we're doing things joyously. We're doing things uh, in a happy way. But we are appealing to something completely different. We are appealing to your new nature. You, you're a new creation in Jesus Christ. You are a generous person. Uh, that's my first point. Generosity is in my nature. Second Peter 1, 4, you may be partakers of divine nature. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave. When David was in trouble because of his grievous sin, murder, adultery, lying, what did he say? Psalm 51, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. David may not have known any, everything, but he knew God is generous. He knew if I go to my church, my religion, so to speak, they're going to tell me they have nothing but death to offer me. They should stone me for what I've done. So David, he bypassed his religion. You know, sometimes you have to bypass religion. And he went straight to God. He says, I'm coming to you, God, because I know you have a generous spirit. <laughs> and then James says this in chapter 1, God gives to all, not to some, not to a few, but to all liberally and without reproach. So, so here it is. Uh, it, you know, God is a great lover, and great lovers are great givers. You've heard me say you can give without loving. Oh, people can give for many reasons, grudgingly, of necessity. But you cannot love without giving. It, it, it's integral in the nature of love to want to give. And why? Why? Why be generous? Why be exhibit the characteristic of God? David said it this way, 1 Chronicles 29, Who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you and of your own we have given you. So, so David recognized this. He said, God controls the inflow and, and, and the outflow. He, he understands my life. Everything I have comes from God, and I am a steward. Now, now stewards are not owners. Stewards are managers. He says, I, I'm a manager. Everything comes from God. This is very liberating. You, you see, giving is very much talked about in the Bible. Faith in the Bible is mentioned 612 times. Hope is mentioned 185 times. Love is mentioned 733 times. But giving is mentioned 2,292 times. Now, I admit it, everybody. You didn't think that was the right thing. You, th you thought, well, love should be number one, faith number two, hope three, and then giving somewhere down there, way down, way down low there. But you see, before you hasten now to make a judgment against the Bible and what, uh, what things are mentioned there, what is giving? Giving is an expression of my faith. Giving is an expression of my love. Giving is an expression of my hope. I'm expressing the hope and the faith and the love that is in my heart because God has loved me so much. Well, welcome to our program today. We took you right into the teaching there. And, and that particular vignette of teaching where I'm talking about that generosity is in our nature. I mean, we are partakers of divine nature. That's the clear teaching of, of, the, of the Scripture and of what Jesus Christ provided for us. And so uh, generosity uh, is a part of who we are. Just, because, just as God, our Heavenly Father, gives liberally to all. God so loved that He gave. And, and so uh, just, um, I'm talking about you. I'm, I'm describing you now, I'm not just talking about God, I'm talking about you who, who have embraced this new life in Christ, that part of that, part and parcel of it, it's a lot of things in that parcel, but part and parcel of it is uh, the generous nature of God. I want to say as well, I made a comment in that opening uh, teaching vignette about King David, that when he had sinned, he appealed to God's generous nature. And whatever you've done wrong, whatever has gone wrong in your life, God is generous to you. And I invite you to just say, Jesus, I confess you as my Lord. 
And uh, whatever trouble you're in, whatever has gone wrong, appeal to the generosity of your God because He loves you and nothing, nothing, nothing can separate you from the generous love of God in Christ Jesus. Well, take that to heart and please respond to that right now, but we're going back to the teaching. Here we go. That old way of legalistic giving, you know, under Moses. See, the Bible never says that we serve the God of Moses. It says we serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because Moses, the law of Moses, it brought about this duress, this necessity, this grudge. You know, they were just hoping and wishing that someday God would open the windows of heaven. Never sure if it would happen or not. You know, when they lived under the law of Moses, they had three promises to stand on. You know the song we sing, Standing on the Promises. You know what promises they had? Promise number one, if you don't tithe and give offerings, you are cursed with a curse. Well, there's a promise to stand on. Second promise was that if you don't tithe and give offerings, heaven will be closed. Oh, I stand on that promise. And the third promise was if you don't do these things, the devil will eat your lunch, breakfast, and supper. He will devour everything you got. That was like doing things with a gun to your head. No wonder they gave something. They said, yeah, I surrender. But of course, we live in a new and better covenant. Jesus became a curse for us. There is no closed heaven because Jesus passed through the heavens and made a new and living way. And as far as the devil is concerned, the devil is already defeated. That's why Jesus went to hell to defeat the devil and took the keys to death and hell and won an everlasting victory. So the devourer is under our feet. No, we, we practice like Abraham. We serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, Abraham, he gave tithe to a fellow called Melchizedek. Now, even the Bible says there are many things not easy to comprehend about Melchizedek, so don't get nervous if you don't comprehend everything. But we know that Melchizedek was a high priest of peace and of God and of righteousness. And after Abraham had won a great victory, God had blessed him. He went to Melchizedek and he brought an offering, he brought tithe, and they celebrated the Lord's table, communion. We take the Lord's table to remind ourselves what God has provided for us. Isn't that beautiful? We participate. Everyone is welcome. And so, what's the difference? Abraham brought his offering after the victory to celebrate an already accomplished victory. He did it freely, not by constraint. Under Moses, you gave so that you would get the victory. You did it because you had to or else. But Abraham's blessing is that the victory is already won. <laughs> Number three, God loves when we respond with love to his love. We love because he first loved us. So there's something about that. When, when love makes us do things, even Paul says if you gave everything you had, you gave your body to be burned, you gave all your possessions. If there was no love in it, it wouldn't profit you any. So God loves when, when his love touches us and we say, oh God, I love you back. We love because God first loved us. Look at this here, same chapter. Verse 7 and 8, as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. I don't speak by commandment, but I speak to prove the sincerity of your love. So he's saying here to the people there in Macedonia, he said, you're abounding in every area. You speak good, you worship good, you pray good, you're diligent. But, you know, don't think that this area of giving, because he's referring to that in these two chapters, don't think that's unimportant. Don't say, well, we, we're so strong. We worship so strong. No. He says, make sure that you don't fall behind in this grace, because it really shows how much you love. So both Paul and Jesus agree that 
biblical money management is connected to love, that love makes us givers. God so loved that he gave. And what it says here, I'm going to repeat verse 3 again. I quoted it earlier. It says, according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability. You know, this is so beautiful. And we do this according to ability. So you say, well, okay, what could I do? Maybe I could give this every week or every month. Or maybe you say, I, I just, I know my rich aunt just died, so I have something coming in there. I could give something. Other. I don't know. You, you know what you have. I hope your aunt didn't die, but if it happened, you know. Or you say, I have a, something coming back on my taxes. So you can figure it out. So the first category is according to ability. And then, but then there's the other one, beyond ability. Now that is where creative faith comes in. Well, you say, God, I, I, I think I can give 700, but I really like to give 1,400, but I don't know how. There's no way I can get my money on that, my hands on that. So you say, God, help me. Show me, Lord. Oh, God, you, you, you. you know, we've seen so much finances for the gospel produced by people who go beyond their ability. They don't know how, but they say, I'm going to take a step of faith. I'm going to believe God. We have people who want to participate, but some say, well, you know, I, I'm going to believe God. I'm going to stretch. I, I'm, I'm going to go beyond my ability and see what God can do. I've done that sometimes. I say, well, I like to do this, but I don't know how, but I'll do what I can, and then I'll add something more. And watch how God will bless you and help you. But the key is, we just got to be willing. God works through the willing. In verse 12, if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted to what one has and not according to what one doesn't have. So somebody could say, well, you know, okay, I'm going to go into creative giving. That means I'm believing to win the lottery this week. Oh boy, Pastor Peter, if I win the lottery, I mean, that'd be creative faith. I'm going to really give. But you know, God isn't a sugar daddy in the sky. He's not uh, running the local lottery either because God doesn't work that he works with people in partnership. I mean, God could have opened heaven and poured down fish and bread on the 5,000, but that's not the way God did it. He worked with the boy, he worked with the disciples, and he blessed what was in their hand. And so on the one hand, you have the area of creative giving where you believe in God and God will bless, but it will still be the work of your hands that he blesses. But then some people say, well, if I had that, but you know, I can't, no, nobody's asking anybody to do what we can't do. He says, it's according to what's in our hand. What do we have? Can I surrender control of what I have? You know, somebody says to me, What's the greatest offering your ministry ever received? And I could tell you that story, but I don't know if it's the greatest offering. I can tell you what the greatest offering was in money. It happened when a person invited me to Beverly Hills a few years ago. It was nice. But I don't know if that was the greatest. To me, maybe the greatest offering I ever received to our ministry was a little old woman on the island of Kariakou in the Caribbean. I was staying in a little hut. There was a few mice and rats staying there with me. I could hear them at night. And every morning, this little lady, she must have been 80 years old, she came to my little beach house where they had put me. Very simple, no electricity, nothing. And she brought me, she'd take off her bandana and she'd fill it with peanuts. And she brought it every morning. She didn't say anything. She didn't even knock on the door. I just looked out on the porch and there was this bandana full of peanuts. And, and I could see this lady. So next, I watched, next morning she came again. She was a very poor lady. Maybe that was the greatest offering. I don't know. Certainly it made a deep impression on me. I, I still remember it as many years ago. So who's to say whether the check with many, many zeros in Beverly Hills was greater than that, I, I, I wouldn't say. I don't know. But I know that the principle with God is the amounts may differ. Equal faith, equal sacrifice. To some people, that'll be like huge. To other people, you know, what, what seems small to one is great to another person. 
But you know, God sees the heart. It's like, it's like if I look at my own life, what's the greatest offering I ever give? Was, was it one of the offerings that Tyna and I have given in the last few years? Or was it when I was a teenager and I gave the work for my summer job? I gave pretty well all of it. Was that, what was the greatest? I don't know. I don't know. I remember them both. <laughs> it's nice to give something you can remember. I can be tempted. You know, preachers can be tempted. And sometimes I'm tempted to pull out one of those good condemning sermons I used to preach 20 years ago. I'm a little tempted. I said, oh, we could raise a lot of money with that, Jesus. You know that. That was a real winner I had there. That, that, that beat everybody. That one was a great one. But you see, I'm also very stubborn. So I'm not pulling out those old socks because I believe ultimately God's grace is better and God's grace will produce more. So, so I'm not going to yield to that temptation. See, it's, oh, we need someone to teach this and that. No, we just need to experience more of God's grace. And I tell you, uh, this morning I was up early and I felt the Holy Spirit say, uh, you're going to teach about generosity. But I felt the Lord say, I want you to pray for the sick in my name. So I'm going to do that. Uh, you know, <laughs> when I think about God's great love, when I think about agape, you know, healing is compatible with agape. Healing is compatible with agape. Uh, two things compatible with God's agape, giving and healing by God's grace. And at the very end of our telecast today, I, I'm going to pray that prayer with you and for you. But uh, the, the services you just saw that vignette from didn't end there. Something else crucially important also happened. So let's watch that. Early this morning, I got thinking about this, the agape love of God and how this word is used in, in connection with our stewardship. But then I thought about, I don't think people have any idea how great God's love is. You know, because human love, there's always the thought, if I love, I'll be loved back. There's always that thought that, that there's a little condition, there's a little hook onto it. You know, but when Jesus took our sins and defeated evil, he realized that he would be reviled, but he says he was reviled, but he didn't revile back. He realized that. But I want to make sure that every person in this room, when you leave here today, you personally know God's love for yourself. Jesus put away your sin, put away your shame, Every human being has felt shame. It's about, who am I? What did I do wrong? They say, you know, post-traumatic stress syndrome, that soldiers experience after a war. We often say, well, it's everything they saw in the war. But you know what most of it is? Psychiatrists tell us it's not what they saw others do. It's what they saw themselves do. Post-traumatic stress syndrome from a war is because soldiers who thought themselves didn't have the capacity to do certain things, suddenly they realize I'm not who I thought I was. I didn't think I could do that. And they come home with great shame. But we don't have to go to war to recognize that shame is a part of the human condition. The first thing Adam and Eve experienced once they had gone their own way. They felt ashamed. They wanted to cover themselves. They wanted to make themselves look good, do the best they can for self-improvement. But you see, Jesus says that whoever shall call on the name of Jesus shall never more be ashamed. Oh, I want to cry when I say that you'll never have to be ashamed again. I said you'll never have to be ashamed again. Whosoever shall call on the name of Jesus shall never be ashamed. Oh, every head bowed right now. I want to give you the opportunity to say I acknowledge Jesus. To say I, I believe Jesus took my sin, my shame, my guilt, and I confess him as Lord, not just a verbal confession, but I confess from my heart. 
if you're not sure that your sins are forgiven, if you've somehow drifted away from God, would you want to be included in this prayer? I, I believe that there are many all over this room who say, yes, I want to be included. I want to be sure. I want to acknowledge Jesus as my Lord. If that's you, lift your hand way up high. Lift your hand way up high. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Who else? Anybody else? Lift your hand way up high. Lift it up way up high. I'm going to look one more time. That's beautiful. God bless you. Yes, I see you. God bless you. How many are aware that the Holy Spirit is helping us here today? God's Spirit is here. Thank you, Jesus. I want everybody to pray. Would you say like this? Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. I'm your beloved. Thank you that Jesus took my sins, put away my shame, died in my place, and rose again. And I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this new life. I receive it now in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to take that one step further, which I did in that meeting that you saw recorded. I said, healing for you is compatible with the agape love of God for you. So, Father, I thank you for every person watching, whatever pain, whatever physical or mental or emotional sickness that has attached itself to them. In the name of Jesus Christ, I speak to that sickness to go in Jesus' name. And I say to you, Jesus Christ heals you. Let me know how God touches your life and, and, and you see the information, how you can get a hold of me. And then I also want to say thank you for everyone who is joining with World Impact Ministries as a giver. We need many more in our giving family. We have right now, we're currently just at one time working on six different campaigns, all of them strategically planned in areas where the light of the gospel is very dim. This is a step of faith. We don't have the finances for it, but, but, and we need your help. So thank you to say, I'm going to become a supporter or go online to do it. God bless you. You are loved. Thank you. Your participation makes the global gospel ministry possible. To share your prayer request or to help bring the gospel to those who have never heard it, text 1-437-776-3366. You can give at www.peteryounger.org or send your gift to World Impact at 188 Nagarjun Colony, Jeripatka, Nagpur, 440014. Together, let's give everyone a chance to know God's love in Jesus Christ.